Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this here video containing a comprehensive list of nine tips you should consider that will improve your sculpting. I've heard rumors that lists do very well here on YouTube and so I've compiled a list pertaining to sculpture, which is something I don't think I've seen here before. Anyways, here are nine tips to make your sculpture better. Tip number one, orient your bony points. Orienting your bony points is key in order to ensure that your figure is balanced or if you're after an unbalanced result, for whatever reason, ensure you accomplish that with a level of control. If you have a large figure, it will be incredibly necessary to orient your bony points in order to make an armature that will accommodate your figure so the armature doesn't stick out of your clay. The bony points we must orient are the ones considered to be structurally important. That means the aces points, which is the two front top corners of our box, the box representing the pelvis, the pieces points, which are the end of the iliac crest in the back, the ankles of the stand leg, which is the leg that carries the majority of the weight in any given pose, and the pit of the neck, and C7 vertebra. And we'll go through each of these bony points individually. The two aces points are easy enough to orient, but where you place the box on your armature will dictate where your center line is headed and where it ends up. In most cases, you want the center line to end in the place where the armature for the head is, so the armature for the head is centered within the neck. This does mean that it requires some testing and trying and exploration in order to find the perfect spot for the box, so that the center line can travel through the center of the box, turn and connect with the ribcage, and travel through the ribcage up to where the armature of the neck is extending. This means the box, which two front top corners represents the ace's points, might need to be moved left or right in order to accommodate the direction of the center line. The height of your box sets the maximum height of your legs, within reason, and the width of your box should be pretty close to representing the actual width of the ace's points on your model in whatever scale you are attempting to create. Now, if there's one thing I'm gonna measure, if I'm gonna measure anything, it's going to be the width of the box to ensure I've set it up correctly so I can rely on that width later on down the line. This can either be done using comparative measurements, essentially taking the width of the box and checking how many times it fits within the height of your model's standing leg, or you can use calipers or tape measurers if you're working at a set scale. How far forward and backwards you place the box should also be double-checked to ensure you have enough depth to cover your arch. Just as our model's pelvis is going to be tilted front to back, usually leaning forward in a standing pose or leaning backwards in a seated pose, so will the box of your sculpture be tilted in the same fashion. Just to reiterate, the box on our sculpture represents the model's pelvis. Now there are several ways to do this. I'm going to tell you the one that I prefer and I'm also going to tell you why I prefer it. From a side view, I can, if I lean a little over from side to side, see both the model's aces points in the front and the pieces points in the back. And these will have a relationship with each other, an angle in between them, and this relationship tells me something about the tilt of the pelvis or the tilt of the box that I want to construct. This will vary from model to model and pose to pose. I can, when seeing both the aces and the pieces points, draw a straight line between them from the side view, which will be the tilt of my box. And doing it this way ensures that the back of the box also represents something structural. The two pieces points, which is the end of the iliac crest running from the aces to the pieces. The pieces are visually easy to spot on most people. They are two small depressions right above the sacrum on the from the back view. So they give me something to begin drawing my sacrum from also, which really, really helps. It's a place to start. Now the depth of the box is somewhat ambiguous. Make sure it's deep enough to cover the armature, but not so deep there's no room to build out the contours of the figure. Now here's how doing things this way is really, really gonna help. Now here's how having the tilt of my box representing the angle between my aces and the pieces Here's how that's really, really going to help me and make life a lot easier for me. 
and this is the reason why I do it this way, really. Having located my pieces, I can locate my C7 and from my C7 the pit of the neck. I'll take the distance from the ground plane up to the bottom of the sacrum, which is where the crease of the buttocks starts. I'll find halfway between these two, and this is usually where the angle break in the knee will happen. I'll then take this half distance and jump to the top of the sacrum from my pieces, and from there I'll take that distance and I'll find the height of the C7. You can try this on your own live model and you'll find it works almost every time. Now, important to note, almost. You can't really rely on any of these sorts of rules blindly. So use this method with caution and check on your model. You'll find some models require a slightly different version, but you can easily tweak this method to suit your model. Having located the height of the C7, you'll find the pit of the neck from the side view by measuring the angle between the C7 and the pit of the neck. With all these bony landmarks located in height, more or less at least, you can use a plumb line to measure how they line up on your model side to side, and then you'll match your sculpture to that. All of this obviously happens all more or less at the same time, so I would check the side to side while checking the height as the same. It's very typical that the stand leg fall in line with the pit of the neck if the model is standing in a more or less regular contrapposto. This tends to be the case. Okay, having located our bony points, orienting our bony points, we can move on to tip number two. And tip number two is draw a straight center line. And people refuse to do this for some reason and think a squiggly center line will do, but it just won't, it, this is not true. The center line should be straight through the pelvis and the rib cage, through the two major bony masses of the body. And eventually will run a straight center line through the head as well. The center line running through the pelvis and the rib cage represents the spine. And the spine bends very little inside these bony masses. Most of the bending in the spine happens in this little section between the pelvis and the rib cage. Very important to note, the spine bends like a spring, not like a wet noodle. A wet noodle spine is a condition called scoliosis, which is a serious condition and usually requires spinal surgery. So treat the center line, which represents the spine, like a spring and not like a noodle. With all your bony points oriented in height and side to side from all four views, you have somewhere to draw your center line to, a place it needs to go. A well-recognized fact of psychology is that not only having a goal to run to, but a fear to run from will increase your chances of staying on track and achieving your goals. And consider this the same thing. You have a starting point in your box, which is nice, but it's nice to know where your center line is headed as well. Then it should be, if all is done correctly, be a simple matter of connecting the dots. Tip number three, four, and five are all related to each other, and so we'll fly through these a little bit faster. And these are all about the major masses, which are pelvis and ribcage. They, this does not apply to the legs. Once all the above is accomplished, you will need to build out the contours of your figure. Always keep in mind while doing this that on either side of your center line, there should be equal widths, meaning there is symmetry in width on either side of your center line. Now with some very, very minor exceptions, this seems to hold true almost, almost every time. Tip number four. Within each bony mass, the angle breaks on either side of your center line will in most cases be symmetrical. Consider that the muscles and bones that reach close to the surface all would be symmetrical. The muscles attached in the same place on either side of a bony mass and the bony protrusions obviously being fairly symmetrical on either side. If a bony mass like the pelvis tilts on your model, the center line of your sculpture would tilt on your sculpture to represent this and all the muscle attachments and bones would tilt with the bony mass, creating symmetry and angle breaks on either side of the center line. With small exceptions, I feel like I have to say that because we are working from life and weird things do happen. With small exceptions, the internal information and the space it occupies will be symmetrical on either side. Obviously more extreme poses will tend to distort this somewhat, but I find it's more true than not. True in more cases than it is not true. Which makes it extremely useful to us and something you can incorporate to make your sculpture better and more structurally sound. Now beware of exceptions to this rule. 
An obvious exception would, for example, be the shoulder blades, which operate individually of the bony mass of the ribcage they sit on top of. Tip number six is very much related to the above. Now I suppose they're all related in a way. Tip number six is symmetry and structure in bony areas to support organic forms. To ensure a figure appears solid and capable of holding itself upright, you should invest effort into making sure the bones are symmetrical and that they follow a more architectural layout than their fleshy counterparts, the muscle. The muscles hang off the bones, like clothes hanging from a clothes hang. So never slack when it comes to representing the bones in a symmetrical and structurally strong fashion. Obviously, we are only really sculpting what's represented on the surface, so the bones that are visually obvious on the surface of your model are the ones that I'm talking about, the ones that you need to worry about. I recognize that this tip, and several others coming later as well, is a bit ambiguous and perhaps not as concrete as one would like or as concrete as the previous points. Some of these last tips are a bit ambiguous and therein lies the beauty, I think. There is opportunity for each individual sculptor to find their own way of interpreting these tips and once you've become more experienced, you'll be able to see how each artist approach this more clearly and how it defines somebody's style. I guess we can talk about style in a video at some point also. Anyways, moving on to tip number seven. Tip number seven is very easy to implement once all the steps above have been completed. Your figure might look something like this right before you reach tip number seven. And tip number seven is unify forms differently on either side of the body. The sculpture we've spent time this far creating has set us up for this step. All these tips about symmetry and structure has been played out, and it's time to transition towards the organic. In most poses, the body will be doing different things on either side, unless you have a very boring T-pose, which means the tension in the muscles will be different. This thusly leads us to both observe and reason that the transition between the forms on either side of the body should be modeled differently. More active parts will require more harsher or sharper transitions, while relaxed parts require more subtlety in the modeled transitions. Leaving the unifying of forms until our structural setup is complete and solid means we can control how much we wish to unify and we can have great control doing so. And I'm always after control, you might have noticed that. I'm, and I'm always after making sure I do everything with intent and not by accident. This step begins us down the path of creating a figure that looks alive and real. Perhaps even more real than real. All the symmetry and structure leading up to this point will still be present and will give us a figure that is strong and won't look like it's about to collapse like a soggy piece of bread. This way we get the best of both worlds. Structure and organic working together. We're in the home stretch, tip number eight, and we are going back to the ambiguous. Tip number eight is unity with variety. All the previous tips inform this one, so I suppose this one is like a, an overarching philosophy running through the entire process. I am definitely looking for an organic end result, and an organic end result comes from variety. But too much variety means not enough structure to support the figure so that it appears convincing. Too much unity and we end up with a neoclassical looking, stylized, graphic, boring figure that looks like... It looks like a sculpture, not like somebody real. And of course this is fine if it's done with intent. But this is definitely not what I am after. How you balance unity and variety is up to you. Leaning too much either way is, in my humble opinion, a mistake. As I stated above, I lean heavily in the unity direction when it comes to bony areas, and I swing in the other direction, the variety direction when it comes to muscles and flesh. In every sculpture I work on, I search for the balance 
required between Unity and Variety. So we're here at the final tip, tip number nine. And this one is really ambiguous. Tip number nine is divine topography. Nothing is more ambiguous than divine topography. I haven't really figured out a good way to explain how, what this truly is or how to achieve it. I'm struggling myself to achieve it. My explanation at the moment will be poor and won't tell the whole story. We'll have to return to divine topography more in depth at a later point when my language suffices. But here's what I have so far. The surface of the figure is not flat, that's obvious. The body is a landscape of rolling hills and sharp peaks. All determined by anatomy, but with seemingly infinite variety and options for interpretations, depending on your model. People will often treat it as a landscape, like waves on the ocean, only heading in one direction and, and very, very even. But it's so much more complex than that. It rises and falls in an infinite number of directions. Sticking with the unity and variety theme from the previous tip, the divine topography will have sharp peaks, sheer cliff sides rising quickly up from the surface. And it'll also have slower rolling landscapes like the rolling hills of Tuscany. Controlling this will allow you to create drama where you want and a subtle calm effect in others. A thing to consider when figuring out the divine topography is the origin and insertion of the muscles that make up the surface. It's not the end-all be-all, but it's a helpful place to start, even though it doesn't tell the whole story. It's just barely the beginning. And there you have it. These are my nine tips for making your sculpture better. I hope you learned something new in this video. Keep in mind, sculpture is an infinite field and there are so many ways to go about things. And these are just nine of my tips that I think could benefit any sculptor. Now let me know what you think, and if you have any other tips, let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video and want to learn sculpture, check out my Patreon page. I give feedback and critiques on people's work, and we talk about whatever you need help with in your sculpting endeavors. So check it out, the link is in the description below. Thank you for watching, and stay tuned for a new video next Thursday. Hit the subscribe button and the bell to be notified whenever a new video comes out. If you enjoyed the video, click the like button and share it with your friends and family. It really helps me out a lot. Thank you for watching, stay creative, and I hope to see you in the next one.